First things first, a lot of people are asking, how do you pronounce this guy's name? <laughs> it's pronounced Pete. <laughs> Pete Buttigieg. Buttigieg. South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Buttigieg. Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Best way to pronounce your last name. <laughs> <laughs> Buttigieg. But uh, around South Bend, they just call me Mayor Pete, and that's fine with me. Name. Well, what has he done? For a guy who's only 37, Pete Buttigieg boosts, boasts an impressive resume. First elected mayor of his hometown at age 29, a Harvard-educated Rhodes Scholar, as well as a lieutenant in the Navy Reserve. Took an unpaid seven-month leave during his mayoral term for a deployment to Afghanistan. Now, this is the only chance you'll ever get to vote for a Maltese-American left-handed Episcopalian gay war veteran <laughs> mayor. <Melinda. laughs> And you could argue that it doesn't get more different from this president than a laid-back, intellectual, young gay mayor from the Midwest. No. <laughs> the old economy. The president's promise is to turn back the clock, that we can somehow just go back to the 1950s. And it's just not true. Right the In order to de defeat this president, we need somebody who can go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, who actually comes from the kinds of communities that he's been appealing to. I don't talk a big game about uh, helping the working class while helicoptering between golf courses with my name on them. I, I don't even golf. As a matter of fact, well, there's no way to have less experience than this president. Uh, I would also say that the experience of a mayor in America, of a city, frankly, of any size right now, is highly relevant to executive leadership office. You could be a very senior uh, senator and have never in your life managed as many people as a mayor of a relatively small community. I have not only more years of government service than the president, but I have more years of, of uh, executive experience than the vice president. And by the way, more wartime military experience than anybody to walk into the Oval Office on their first day on the job since George H.W. Bush. Everybody is... Party. I mean, some of these themes, right. God, uh, uh, freedom, patriotism, right? Th these are not things that... Uh, that one party should be able to claim, but that's how it's worked out. We, we made it sound like the only way to apply, uh, for example, religious values in politics would be through the lens of the religious right. When, when I go to church, what I hear a lot about is uh, protecting the downtrodden and standing up for the immigrant. Sure, and, I mean, scared. to me, that, that's the sort of thing that the religious left, uh, often without much attention, has been arguing for for, for my whole lifetime. Uh, and I began to realize just how stark the class and regional divides had become, that I could count on one hand the number of people I knew at a place like Harvard who had gone on to serve. And I began to feel like I was part of a problem. Hmm. Um, I'm really glad I did get the chance to serve. It helped me connect with very different Americans, people, especially when I was deployed to Afghanistan, who um, I had almost nothing in common with, different politics, different generation, different racially, different regionally, but you learn to trust each other with your life because that's what the job requires. And I want more Americans to have that, but I don't want you to have to go to war to get it. It's one of the reasons I good. What I'm proposing is that we depoliticize the court. In other words, we set it up so that some of the justices are not chosen through the partisan political process, but instead are chosen by a consensus among the others. Yes. Look, the bottom line is, this system is not working for us. The court is coming to be viewed as a nakedly political institution, and we need to depoliticize it. Remember, and I would argue uh, a, a democracy might go ahead and pick its national leader by just counting up all the votes and giving it to the person who got the most. Anyway, is your main argument against Medicare for all now that it can't get passed or that it won't work? Look, I think it could very well be the long run destination, but I think there's got to be some humility in our policy here. Uh, let's put this out there and see if it's really the best plan for everybody. I think it will be the best plan, but I'm not willing to assume that it is the right plan for you out of Washington and order you to take it whether you want to or not. If it's the right plan, then everybody will move to it until it is the single player, payer. And if it's not the right plan for everybody, then we're going to be really glad we didn't kick some Americans off their private plans. I'm thinking, for example. One of the things that's become very clear in our time is that if you have racist policies or racist systems and you go out and you try to replace them with neutral policies, that's actually not enough uh, because the harms that have been created by this inequality uh, are intentional and they have compounded. And so it's going to take intentional work to address them. To have an abortion. You know, I think the, the dialogue has got so caught up on where you draw the line that we've gotten away from the fundamental question of who gets to draw the line. And I trust women to draw the line when it's their own.
Just to be clear, you're saying that you would be okay with a woman well into the third trimester deciding to abort her pregnancy. So let's put ourselves in the shoes of a woman in that situation. If it's that late in your pregnancy, that means almost by definition, you've been expecting to carry it to term. We're talking about women who have perhaps chosen a name, women who have purchased a crib, families that then get the most devastating medical news of their lifetimes. And the bottom line is, uh, as horrible as that choice is, uh, uh, that woman, that family may seek uh, spiritual guidance, they may speak, seek medical guidance, but it's, that decision is not going to be made any better, medically or morally, because the government is dictating how that decision should be made. Professionally, I had two things in my life that really mattered to me professionally. One of them was being an officer in the military, in the reserve, and the other was being an elected official. In fact, both of which I assumed were totally, totally incompatible with being out. Were you sure at the time when you came out that it would cost you re-election? I was pretty sure it was going to be a big complication. I mean, no executive in Indiana had ever been out. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of a leap of faith. Uh, I wrote it all down, put it in an op-ed, um, dropped it in the South Bend Tribune, and, and woke up that day and saw what would happen. And, and then got re-elected with 80% of the vote. And then there you go. And, you know, that was more than I got elected in the first place. Um,